Hi everyone. Uh, okay, so Paul's going to introduce us or himself first, but I'm just going to come around and give you some little slips of paper. If you get one, just hold on to it and don't worry about it for now. It will become clear in due course. Hello every, everyone. I'm Paul Knox. I'm Professor of Plant Cell Biology at the University of Leeds and my interests are cell walls, the structures around all the cells in a plant and some of the images uh, from work in my laboratory are going to be shown uh, on the screen and they're going to rotate through as we go through uh, things. And I'm particularly interested in developing molecular tools for ident identifying, for example, in this image here, uh, the phloem cells. So you may remember phloem and xylem, the vascular tissue uh, of plants. Uh, but in terms of, and that's sort of quite technical and a lot of detail, uh, but in terms of outreach, the sort of things that we're interested in in my laboratory is to sort of get across to school children and the general public that plants are a really interesting set of organisms, that they're the basis of all food chains, that, that phrase, all flesh is grass. And, and an item that Claire and I discussed a lot, that they really have sort of distinctive modes of development, modes of being, that they're just very different life forms, but really important, really interesting. They're important because we eat them, they provide all the molecular oxygen uh, that we breathe. Um, so maybe, well, maybe I'll hand over to Claire. So I'm Claire, so I'm a novelist and short story writer, and my interest, I suppose, is in representing and kind of interrogating human consciousness, so kind of really drilling down into how does it actually feel to be alive, to be a human. Uh, so this is like totally outside my comfort zone. Uh, before I met Paul, I thought, plants are just a bit boring. I don't even know any of their names. I eat some of them, look at some of them. <laughs> um, but I found it really interesting as kind of looking at the plant as just a different way of being in the world and seeing how could that, how would that affect my writing? Because hum we talked a lot about how with humans, you know, we have this internal world we feel is so complicated that no one else understands, like, no one else understands how it feels to be me. And this causes us a lot of problems, um, also a lot of joy. Whereas plants, you know, it's inside and outside is the same. Like all their organs are on the outside. Um, and it turned out Paul was also a great reader. And we talked a lot about books that we liked and why we read. Um, and Paul actually introduced me to this book. Yeah, perhaps, Alberta and Jacob by a Norwegian author. Yeah, so. perhaps I can just say a little bit about that because the work from my laboratory is quite visual and we have lots of sort of micrographs, images taken down microscopes. I was sort of, um, I don't know if I've ever said this to Claire, I was sort of hoping for a visual artist maybe to link both. But <laughs> no, <laughs> and a sculpture. And actually the building, and when we met up, I, I, Claire came to, we gave her a tour of the building I work in, the plant growth laboratories, et cetera, which is the Irene Mann building and um, Irene Manton was a major figure on this campus in the 60s and the 70s I think uh, and uh, a big figure and there's lots of interesting things about her maybe we can talk about some of them later but an interesting one she had a major art collection and she also was the first person in the UK to use an electron or in the world to use an electron microscope to look at plant structures and actually in the Leeds Art Gallery at the University Art Gallery at the moment there's an exhibition of Austin Wright sculpture and there's actually micrographs by Irene Manton on the wall because she was a great friend of that sculptor who was a uh, one of these art fellows in the 60s here at Leeds. Uh, and then I was just want to say how I discovered, uh, so I was very pleased to uh, link with a, a novelist. And a year ago, almost exactly to the day, I went in my work, I had to go to the uh, Arctic University of Tromsø in Norway, beyond the Arctic Circle, to carry, discuss research collaborations. And one evening I was there, I wandered around, there's a little uh, exhib um, reception going on, a little art exhibition. And this was Cora Sandal's house. And I didn't know who Cora Sandal was, but I went in and had a glass of wine and looked at some photographs. And then, uh, I'm a great reader, I enjoy fiction very much. And then I read Cora Sandal, and she was one of the most amazing, in English, not in Norwegian, I read the translation. And one of the most amazing reads, certainly of last year. Uh, and then assesses, because we, we, we had lots of meetings and ch exchanged lots of books. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I was quite excited to be given a book um, by a completely unknown author who I think is actually now out of print. Um, and I felt this book completely conveyed the sense of the interior life that we've been discussing and trying to get at. 
Um, so I'll just read you a very short extract from it that um, I particularly liked. Alberta pressed her nose resignedly against the window pane. It was not easy to unravel mysteries. No one spoke straight out, neither books nor people. All those who were in the know were like members of a secret society, a Freemasonry, in agreement that, they sh that their shared knowledge should be kept to themselves. They tittered, they joked, they knew so much and took pleasure in knowing it. All about her, the town was full of secrets. Behind all she saw that she saw with her own eyes, there lay a reality about which no one would speak out loud. It lured and frightened, attracted and disgusted her simultaneously. In it, unheard of, unthought of, and dreadful things were done. But people had a smile in their eyes and a chuckle in their laughter when they thought of them and hinted at them. Um, now, I thought this gave a great sense of the kind of discovery and secrecy and just the kind of otherness of the world and experience that probably everyone feels sometimes. Uh, but that also, I think, is quite essential to both science and art, the sense of seeing something new and different from the first time and not being afraid of that. Um, and I guess that sort of links to Irene Manton as well. Um, we talked quite a lot about her life and her story and, you know, just how interesting it was that she rose to such a prominent position in science, especially at that time. Um, and we thought about maybe creating some sort of uh, site-specific performance at Botany House, which is where she was based, uh, which sort of uh, dramatized maybe certain elements of her life, but also gave a sense of that, the sheer excitement of scientific discovery, which or any kind of discovery, uh, artistic as well, of just seeing something new that you've discovered, you've seen or conveyed for the first time. Because uh, for me, I think that's what keeps me writing. I mean, there's occasional moments where you're like, oh yeah, like this is new, this is different. And I assume it's similar in science, you know, there's a lot of trudgery and feeling lost, uh, like with the, in the previous presentation, that sense of being lost and not knowing what's going on, I think is very true to kind of the artistic and scientific process. But then you get those little moments of insight and that's what kind of keeps you going. Yeah, I think that's exactly, I mean, we, we, Claire and I met several times and we had uh, several series of wonderful discussions and it's exactly the same, I think, science. It's very, it's a highly creative process and you have to do lots of writing. I particularly enjoy the writing and you have sort of uh, blocks and then you think, well, I'll cr create that paragraph when you're writing a scientific paper or something and they get a similar sort of buzz uh, from that, I think. Uh, so. We, we had the conversations and we sort of wanted to try, uh, we talked about, you know, how fiction works, how plants communicate with each other, how they send signals uh, to each other in the soil, etc., uh, and how humans sort of communicate with each other. So we had a, ra a range of discussions around uh, these uh, issues. Yeah, Paul, um, I went to a few of Paul's undergrad lectures, which was quite, um, I studied history at undergrad, so I hardly ever had any lectures, so it was quite hard for me to go at like 9am <laughs> with a load of 18 year olds, but I quite enjoyed it. Um, and I was, I was pleasantly surprised by how much I understood, probably not as much as I thought, maybe. Uh, he also gave me lots of books about biology, including one called Alice in the Land of Plants, which was, which was actually a pretty good read. Um, and I found really interesting this idea of kind of plants providing us with a different model of intelligence, right? So as humans, we kind of think, oh, we've got abstract thought, we are so clever, we create aeroplanes, you know, everything else is just like animals, plants are so stupid, but actually, you know, that abstract thought also causes us a lot of problems. Like, you know, we all, you know, you keep eating or drinking when you know you should probably stop, you know, we're destroying the environment, even though we know it's, you know, we know that's what we're doing, we still carry on. Uh, whereas maybe we kind of have something to learn from organisms that are actually, uh, they still, they can't override their biological signals. That's kind of, they're constantly adapting and changing to survive. Um, so I guess we came to ask the question, can we use fiction to kind of represent plants' way of being in the world without anthropomorphizing them? Which is kind of impossible, but we thought, let's have a go anyway. <laughs> Um. Yeah, so we, we had this, you know, how can, because we, you know, plants, they're, they're different in their grow, the growth, they're constantly extending their surfaces, they have no internal organs, uh, and they're constantly signaling, sensing, and responding to the environment. Uh, so we discussed these sort of issues in, the, in, the, in relation to this, this book, Alice in the World of Plants, uh, and then we, then we came up with sort of, how can we sort of 
get a voice? How can we have a voice from a set of organisms? Because we, we talked about life as a whole, how long it's been around, how it's evolved. Can we try and get a voice uh, for a set of organisms other than humans? Yeah, because we also talked about how, you know, as humans, we kind of think, oh, I've arrived. We're the only things. We're, we're the only voice out there. But actually, we're just one of many, many voices. And we maybe need to learn to listen to those other voices a little bit. Um, so we came up with this idea of the babble of the earth um, as a kind of way of kind of creatively representing and exploring this. So, are we ready? Should we end this? Yeah, I think. So I think you, this is where you guys, your bits of paper, if you have one. I'm sorry we didn't have more. We, I think we weren't expecting quite so many people. <laughs> um, so if you've got a piece of paper, just have a read of it and note the number on your piece of paper. So you're all going to be participating in making a bubble of the earth. <laughs> um, and I'm going to hold up the numbers. Right. Our seeds are gone. We miss them. They are our last hope. Will we see another season, another time of great light, another input of energy? Eight. Their feet are stinky. They are covered in corns and mold. But still they worship. We do not know how to make them stop. The brain trample us with their ramparts through them solid spaces to transform their... Some of us are strong enough to push through their solids to transform their... We bend to the wind and endure hours and days of wind. We are locked together so tightly, even through the night. Those of us deep in the ground hold us fast as the wind stirs up, stir up the air. Brains are crying and thinking, cries and thoughts. The brains rampage without caution, as to whether it is light or dark. Is there or is there not light? That is the question. We ask it in the water and we ask it in the dry. Tomorrow is today's answer. Tomorrow is the play of dark and the light of now. You can read it at the same time. The brain is simply live behind walls, but our growing bodies allow us to reach out into the air. Up above the earth, into the to hold the knowing against the wind, we cannot know to hold our throat high. Change, we we grow. Grow. Then there are less of us, 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 it takes much strength to cross the crowd. It's always changing. It's so are we. It's what we do. Thanks, guys. Um, thank you for making that. <laughs> I really enjoyed hearing all those yeah, like actual different voices, not just us talking about it. Um, so that, I think I mean that that we we had several ideas for what we, we were going to do as a performance, and that is the one that we've uh, come up with. So I, I, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, Coming back to Irene Manton, we were just coming, as we're walking here today, we were thinking, you know, what we can do 
because uh, we had so many conversations that we keep forgetting. For example, on some of these books, Claire, uh, Claire would recommend a book and then I'd forget and she'd mention it sort of several weeks later. So, uh, you know, I, I'd read it then and it's similar. I think we had a big discussion with Irina Manton very early on and then we forgot. And there's various features about Irene Manton. I'm just going to give one little story. And I learned this recently about her. And I can't remember why I learned it. But she, she was a fellow of the Royal Society, which is one of the most prestigious things a scientist could be. She had a sister who was also a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, so that was very unusual that two women uh, at that time, uh, sisters. And the day that her sister decided, told Irene Manton that she was going to get married... I really never spoke to her again. So we think there might be something interesting there. Yeah, so this quite interests <laughs> me as like a dramatic situation. Um, you know, unhappy families famously make interesting <laughs> literature or drama. Um, but then we were talking more and we thought just if you could tell that story whilst also conveying the kind of the excitement of discovery, that could be quite an interesting area of development um, as well alongside this idea of the bubble and plant versus human voices and whether we could maybe develop some sort of immersive experience uh, involving text and maybe sound as well um, to convey that. Those were just a couple of uh, lines that we thought we might pursue going forward potentially. Yeah, because Irene Manton was a microscopist uh, and therefore she, she, she in a sense saw things that no one else had seen before. So we think there's a potential there as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, any questions you can ask now or later. <laughs>